As a disclaimer, some of our episodes discuss topics that may not be fit for a younger audience. Some episodes also contain some swearing. This show was produced by the Geek Happy Network, creators of the very best in audible oracle entertainment. If you enjoy listening to Represented, remember to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And welcome to the Represented Podcast. I'm your host, Nyx. And back again with another special episode. I feel like I've said every episode has been special at this point. But it is still special because I have another friend in the building. Um, hello to our viewers, by the way. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to welcome to the studio, Maria. Thank you, thank you, Would you, you like you. to tell us your full names, all of them? So my full name is actually Maria Goretti mm-hmm. Boke Muita. <laughs> All right. Yes. That's so. another conversation already. <laughs> <It is. laughs> okay, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, but Maria is a relatively new friend to me, I yeah. think. But it doesn't feel that it way. It doesn't, yeah. And I think just the fact that we've always seen each other around, mm-hmm. like, Vancouver in mm-hmm. general, hang out with similar people. Yeah. And yeah, 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 so I guess this was like a something that that brewed during the summer, yeah, and um, so welcome to the Represented thank Podcast. You, thank you. How thank are you, you today? So I'm good today. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's so many places all these conversations can go. Yeah. Um, this podcast is generally about just exploring people's life journeys yeah. and just like whatever is on your mind, mm-hmm. whatever you're passionate about, mm-hmm. whatever it is you've been thinking about lately. Mm-hmm. Um, I just like to just sit down and pick people's brains. Mm-hmm. Wherever it goes is where it goes. Yeah. Um, That's exciting, though. You yeah. Know, there's nothing, you know, clear cut. You're just For sure. going out. Of it. Yeah. <laughs> what are you? What do you do right now? So right now, I am in between my, the end of my undergrad, mm-hmm. and I'm joining grad school. Okay. So there's some pre classes that I have to take. Mm-hmm. What and are also, you taking? So I'm still continuing with math, but at the same time, I'm still not certain. Math. She yeah. said math. <laughs> Before I said math, <laughs> what the hell, yo? Yeah. What? Yeah, How does one major in math? Why? Know, so, funny story. When I was younger, I was always terrible at mathematics. It, you, it, oh, that subject where I have all A's and everything, and then an F mm. in math, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. it's just one of those things where I, I think even my family had accepted Maria will always be an artistic student. She will, mm. m- the mathematics will not be her stronghold. Mm-hmm. But that is something my father never accepted, right? Because mm-hmm. he felt like I had a bad experience with the teacher, which yeah. is true. That's I so huge very, with Yeah, math. especially when you're young. It's, it's such a defining thing. You know, and I had a very bad experience with the teacher, and it changed my perspectives completely, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So fast forward high school. So I attended, <laughs> in my life I have attended around 17 schools. Wow. Every, yeah, in what? different countries. Uh, right. What was the first school you attended and where was it? So the first school I attended was in Nairobi. Mm-hmm. It was McKinney. So I was born in Nairobi, Nairobi okay. West Hospital. Okay. Shout out Shout to out those guys. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and um, then at the time, my parents were living in, not in Maradaima, but shortly after I was born, we moved to Langata, okay. Southlands. LA. Uh, yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, I you know, I was brought up there, so on and so forth. And the first school I attended was Makini, actually. Okay. 
And then Makini wasn't a great fit for me. I moved to Santana's. Mm-hmm. But that was still... Why wasn't it a good fit? I, I don't know. At the time, I was a child, so I can't really tell you. But okay. my, my dad always felt like that, you know, maybe uh, a certain school that would challenge me more academically would be better. Mm-hmm. So that was... It, it was... I, I, I personally didn't know the difference. Mm-hmm. So for them, it was just like where it's closer to home and where there's transport. And mm-hmm. then, you know, those things that okay, really... Especially yeah. when you're a child, just your logistics. parents are very particular about those mm-hmm. things. Yeah. Then I moved to St. Hannah's. That was my first school. But I ended up again moving back into McKinney. Okay. When I was, I think, in class one, class two. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time, having problems with, you know, math and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. And it was just, it was very uncomfortable, especially you're sitting in a class where everybody seems to get it besides mm-hmm. you. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that's, I feel like that's majority of the struggles. Yeah. With math especially, it's yeah. like the shyness that you didn't get the answer yeah. kills you way more than wanting to know the answer. And when you're young, what that does is that it withdraws you. Mm-hmm. Because when you're chasing joy, the one thing that makes you feel hurt mm. is not something you want to tackle. You avoid it. Yeah, completely. you're like, okay, that story's over. So. <laughs> <laughs> you might be, you have me thinking like I might have a career in math now. Because yeah. like, be, like, for me, um, like math was a battle at home. Yeah, I Since know. standard three, I remember the first... When I knew math was gonna be a flop, my mom had to write notes to school. Like, Uh yo, help this Uh dude. (laughs) The teacher is writing back, and Uh it's like. And then what made it worse was my dad Uh is an architect, Uh and for him, math is like, you know. So learning from him was always hell, and it was like, yo, dog, I can't, I can't do this. (laughs) And so then those bad negative feelings about math started coming up. Yeah, and it's like, I mean, no, no, no shade to my dad, (laughs) but like, (laughs) dad's. Kenyan dads or African dads yes, can be rough when it comes yes. to teaching you. So for me, mm-hmm. both my parents are bankers. So my mom mm. worked in the bank for 20 years. Mm. My dad still works in the bank. He's okay. going to almost 40 years in the bank, right? Mm. And so for him, growing up, his stronghold was mathematics. Mm. So much so that he thought he was going to be an engineer, okay. right? So my father attended Nairobi school and then he did. He went to... Was it Starehe? Starehe then Nairobi okay. school, right? Okay. And then he was always very good at mathematics and he would always tell us stories. You know, back then when the teachers were British, you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. Know, yeah. Same, same. Exactly. I, we grew so up with the exactly, same kind right? of dad. Because <laughs> my dad, I think my dad went to Nairobi as oh, well. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it was called something else, right? Yeah, yeah. The back days then. when it was like Prince of this. And yeah, those yeah. eras, mm-hmm, you know, and mm-hmm. the teachers were British. Yeah. And they, you know, my dad would always say, Maria, I walked into class. So he, he came to school a little late one time and then uh, he, he came from the village and then he got into class and, you know, he, the, t- the class had no idea what the answer to the question was. Mm. Now, this guy from Kuria, you know, Kuria yeah. is the border of Kenya and Tanzania, yeah, so yeah, describe, which is far. Describe, yeah. So, mm-hmm. like, your, f- your people are from Kuria. Yes. I, I know a lot of Kenyans out there also might not know where, who, who, who the Kuria people exactly. are. Exactly. So, yeah. you might want to give us a quick. So, the Kuria people, our tribe is bigger in Tanzania. Okay. But we have a population, uh, like a four, five, six po- uh, populations, uh, sorry, uh, generations mm-hmm. that came from Tanzania okay. into the border of Kenya and Tanzania, mm-hmm, right? And mm-hmm. they settled there into what is almost stretches into Masai Mara, right? So the people who would know us best are people in the Kisumu Saturday. region, Masai Mara, and, and then that's the Koreans, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And then, but my dad is Korea. My mom is not fully Korea. My late grandfather who died this summer was half Masai, half, Ka- he was part Masai, part Kalenjin, part Korea. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. And then my grandmother is full Habesha, she's full Ethiopian. Oh, yeah, wow. From the Marsabit region at the top. Or Jeez, not on the you're side. like, a, I didn't know you're this much exactly. of a cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever I explain it, somebody's like, you're the, you, you know, you're the true Kenyan. I'm like, yeah. in many ways, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I, yeah, yeah, so it's it's a mixture of a lot of things. Yeah, so you're saying your dad... Yes, mm-hmm. so he joined from one first day of school. He saw the question on the board and boom, he knew the answer. And the British teacher was like, thank God for Samuel. And that is something, <laughs> if you meet my dad, he will tell you that He's story proud. over and over. Like, Maria, she said, thank God for Samuel. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, he's proud of his, uh, you know, his mathematical skills, which are brilliant, mm-hmm. I must say. So when he used to teach me mathematics, and again, bear in mind, I have a very rough time in school mm-hmm. with these teachers. Mm-hmm. I come home, it's like some minutes to midnight. I have to wake up at six in the morning to go to school, mm. arrive there at seven. Mm. My dad, the question is on page 460. My dad is like, Maria, but the concept be that require, you know, the, what you, you're required to go back to page oh, one. No, yeah. Let's open page one. Oh, I'm God. Like, <laughs> my guy, it's, how, it how is about some, no? how about no, <laughs> yeah. right? Let's not do that. You know, I'm like, you know what? It just occurred to me that I actually know how to do it. Mm-hmm. Let me just go and sleep. And he, 
he always would encourage me you need to improve your math skills you need to improve your math skills mm. but then i i always felt like it's a bother something and the one thing that i loved about my parents growing up again one thing i experienced also during that time i was having a rough time with school was mm. bullying mm. i was bullied for three years oh wow, right? wow. yeah, yeah. I, I transferred schools a lot again mm-hmm. because we used to move regionally and then internationally okay. right and why so internationally because my dad's job so he worked for Barclays for for 30 years okay Barclays yeah so what could take him exactly out? so okay. we would move within Kenya so I lived in Nairobi we lived in Eldoret we lived in Mombasa I was brought up in Mombasa in wow. Diani yeah and when I was a child. you know what's funny mm-hmm. someone could could at least me let yeah. me say me uh-huh. I I would have I could have if someone asked me to guess yeah. I would have said you're um, Swahili. <laughs> yeah, I don't know you have like a a coastal <laughs> vibe, coastal about vibe you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know it, it comes from the Tanzanian aspect mm, of my family, right? Sense, so yeah. the Swahili for us is a huge thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's why even sometimes when I meet people from Mombasa they're like are you sure you weren't yeah. born around here? <laughs> yeah. Like I have lived in Diani though. Yeah, yeah in coastal okay. Kenya. Nice. And so we moved regionally and also we started around one of the reasons why we also moved was because you know sometimes some schools were not suitable it, when you're doing class 8 you know you want to be in that proper school that makes sure that you, you get yeah, proper so i took the kcpa right but mm-hmm. in that duration i was actually adam and i used to be the same class oh that's cool. why we always in, school? in real yeah, okay, yes. okay, okay. yeah. Nice. shout out to adam I, uh, adam was on i think the third or the second episode of this podcast yes. and childhood friend of mine yes. lives in Vancouver now but yeah. Yeah, so Adam and I were actually in the same class. But Adam used to be quiet back then. <laughs> Still actually is. both were yeah. both of us were honestly. Yeah. Because it used to be a very rough group of you kids, right? Mm-hmm. And so it yani I feel like that experience of being bullied, it literally shifted my life mm. completely up until today, right? Yeah. So what were kids bullying you about? The most ridiculous of things. It's actually pretty pretty dumb to to speak of. So first thing, I had always struggled with weight as a child. Okay. And you know, it's one of those things where you're sh- you're transitioning in from childhood into adulthood, so the pimples are coming in, the weight is coming in. Your body as a woman is also trying to formulate itself mm. like where does this go? Where does that go? Where does this go? And so that's one thing. And then at the same time, I so around the time my dad was uh you know the, there are certain cars that used to come out in Kenya mm-hmm. the first people you would see it with were ministers mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. so the prado mm-hmm. you know those beige prados yeah. those big ones mm-hmm. the f- only other person who had that car besides a particular minister was my dad at mm-hmm. the time when they came out and the only reason was because banks used to buy them for uh, s- their staff members yeah, of a yeah. certain caliber right so my dad is one of that old people in the bank so they would get him that car right and you would be surprised how difficult that car made my life really yeah how everybody was like you know of course my teacher i used to have a math teacher the same math teacher i'm telling you who gave me a hard time oh maria don't think just because you're failing the math class you're going to inherit your father's oh, money oh maria that's that's toxic. and then this is the worst part mm. the worst, and i'm like now who's talking about because that car to me was nothing so for me it's how am i going to get my homework done not the car i am mm. inside mm. it never occurred to me yeah. there were some days when my mom's car was not working we would come in uh we would come to school in a in a really old like rundown that thing could have been like the flintstones mm. you know <laughs> so those, those <laughs> you know those things on that you could be jogging yeah. on the ground <laughs> surrounded by metal yeah. but for me it wasn't a thing you know it was one of those yeah. things. and it used to confuse these kids one day you're coming in a flash yeah, car the next yeah. day you're coming in some weird so it's just like but nevertheless the teacher still used it against I, me. and the worst part was it was hurtful but i didn't understand why yeah it, 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 first of all it's like why as such, how is it an issue yeah. so, and then so what he would do sometimes was that the whole class hasn't done they're not sure he's not sure whether the class has done their homework or not mm. a class of 30 40 people he doesn't <laughs> know but maria boke uh, have you yeah, done your yeah, homework yeah yeah and it's so much so that the kids they would turn put on pressure you on me yeah. but make sure you've done your homework oh, my you know God. it's just it's one of those things when you think back it, it it's you almost feel i felt responsible but i didn't understand why did i feel responsible like that right so the teachers were in one way bullying me and also the students mm-hmm. were in one way bullying me so much so that this particular teacher when my dad came to pick me now another thing that these kids used to give me a rough time for if you were in the kcpc e system you would come to school on saturdays mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so riara was one of those schools where we came to school yeah. on saturdays the only time we didn't come to school was on public holiday and sundays mm-hmm. right so Saturday would be in school from 9 to 4. And so actually 10 to 4. Mm-hmm. And lunch time on Saturdays given that my whole family is at home, mm-hmm. they would bring me lunch 
to school, right? So typically, this, uh, this, these kids would go and eat, would go and eat at the yeah. dining area, mm-hmm. right? And they would be given, I don't know, like, you know, this school standard foods, but mm-hmm. of course it wasn't great, but it was okay, mm-hmm. right? So my parents are like, let's bring you lunch. Now that's also Because they lived like, close, right? Exactly. Yeah. I, we lived 15 minutes mm-hmm. uh, away. So my, yeah. even when I forgot my homework, my yeah. mom would still go get it from mm-hmm. me, right? Mm-hmm. But so they would, uh, you know, come bring me pizzas. And you know, back then pizzas were a thing. It's like, yeah, yeah, right? yeah like when, you get pizza. Exactly, it's right? Cool, it's terrific crazy. Tuesdays. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yeah. so they would come and they would bring me pizza. The school created a rule. No, oh, damn. No outside food. You know what? Although I will say like, it's weird. I but, can understand it. Yeah. I can understand but it. But where the position you're in at that time, exactly. it's like, yo, can I have one thing? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But you know, for me, it's uh, when they made that rule, even my parents are like, it's good. It's fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would have an exactly one hour break uh, uh, for lunch. Oh. They would come, if it, the lunch time was, well, lunch time was like at one. Mm. My parents would come at 12.59. Mm. They were downstairs. They drive out. We yeah. go out. Yeah. They take me out for lunch. And also, that's also something that created tension More for tension, me yeah. with the kids and the teacher and the teachers and the staff. It's just like, there is no way to fully, mm. you know, oppress this whole, you know, kind of this favorite special thing. Yeah, this special gets, child. Yeah. Another thing that added onto it, we would, so I never used to go for school trips. My parents were, and still are, mm. extremely protective, mm. right? Mm. And so we went to uh, Brackenhurst. Mm. I love that place. I love so that. went to Brackenhurst and it was just, it was uh, this last school trip before as KCPE candidates mm-hmm. would do exams and so it would be an entire year of like hectic academia, right? And so I we went to Brackenhurst and my parents, they're like, bye Maria, bye. I thought they went home. Yeah. They collected each other and then drove right behind the school <laughs> <laughs> <Are you laughs> to serious? come follow me. But the only reason why they couldn't stay sleep yeah. in Brackenhurst, there was no room. <laughs> now drive back to Nairobi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so like what I'm hearing from you is that on one hand, your parents were just kind of trying to be like they were giving you opportunities to have nice things yes. in the least unfair way. Yes. But at the same time, with this trip example, mm-hmm. that sounds like it's a bit overbearing. Where yeah. was the balance? Did, like So for me, the, the thing is, I, at the time there was no balance. Mm. Yeah, And I'll tell you, and it's right now you see more of a balance because I'm grown and I am living away. And there's that, okay, we hope you make the right decision kind mm-hmm. of thing. Mm-hmm. But at the time... It was their way of showing love. So sometimes mm. I'm, I'm sure they didn't know when they were going above and beyond, mm. right? But nevertheless, I never really, you know, stopped them mm-hmm. because what I lacked in school, the kindness, and yeah. I'm not asking for anything. Mm. I'm not asking for special treatment. Mm. The last thing I would ask for is that. But that simple kindness, um, and on even even just not even kindness, then leave me alone, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Even that mm-hmm. is not At there. At the very least, yeah. At the very least, then leave me alone. Mm. And if that's not even there, so y- and you're, re- you're on the receiving end of all sorts of hostility. Yeah, my yeah. parents were like, we will make up for it at home. Yeah. Right? And there was no attempt for your folks to like talk to the school about they it? They did it so many yeah. times. Yeah. So many times. And my da- and they feared calling my father to school mm. because my father would show up there and put them on full blast. Like, mm. That they, probably didn't help it your did not situation. Exactly. Yeah. It didn't. So that's why I also sometimes used to stop him. I'm like, listen, mm. you know, these people, because, and I, he, he's, he's defending me as his daughter, right? Mm. Because Maria does not misbehave. Maria does not get into fights. Maria does not do anything wrong. Mm-hmm. You would never catch me in any situation. But then there was this one time. And you know, there's always that one there's time. Always that, yeah, obviously. You know? Yeah, there's always. This kids did something and it was a collective hostility like in t- the entire class actually got together to just bully me and you know mm. pump, pump, you know, there was a, that unity mm. and, that, and so i cried the whole evening you know even in class i couldn't focus i was just crying even teachers came in all the teachers and the entire staff came in to tell off the whole class mm. how dare they do mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. you know single-handedly just harass me like that and then I kept crying. The whole, I couldn't even help myself. I went downstairs to the car. You know, it was time to go home. And I kept crying. And my sister is now crying because she's, you know, she's seeing me crying. Mm-hmm. Then my dad starts getting stressed out. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I told him, listen, there is no one in school. Let's just go home. The truth is there was someone in school. Mm-hmm. He could have, you know, put blasted someone. But he was like, whatever. We went home. Now, I remember that day because my mom was making gali. Shout like, out to gali. Hey, gali. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she was, she was, she held, she held the stick. Uh, on her waist and she was like Maria you know I'm surprised up until this point my dear you are not in juvie because I would have beaten up those kids Mm. now that was a confidence that I had never received from anyone Mm. somebody to tell me it's okay you Mm. can retaliate Mm. it's okay to retaliate 
because after taking it in for three years, the last year, and it was that year where they're writing for you recommendations. Oh, Maria is a good girl, la la la. Yeah. She can go to Form this. One yeah, exactly. And, all that stuff. Exa- and yeah. it was such an imperative time. Mm-hmm. You can't really mess up. Exactly. So, it's that transition to high school. Exactly. Like you need so a good high school. If you have a bad report, which high school wants to take mm-hmm. you? No one, right? Mm-hmm. So I was really trying my best to hold it in for that last lap. The next day I go to school. This you know, so we are emptying our desks, right? We are about to do KCPE and everything. We're emptying our desks. This kid made a uh, a comment that it, you know, you know, he called me the B word, right? Mm. And so it's not it's one of those things where I was always like, ah, it's not like a big deal. Mm-hmm. They've said worse, they've done worse. But this time I was almost waiting for someone to provoke me mm. so that I can re- literally like, you know, yeah. Yeah. you know, discipline them. And so and so I did. So I we got into a huge fight, physical fight. Right, and so it became a big deal. The teachers threatened to call my parents. I was like, call them. In fact, mm. this is their number. Call them. Wow. And you know, African schools, when yeah. the teacher threatens to call your parents, you're freaking out. Yeah. You're not like, oh, yeah. you know, it's yeah. like, oh my gosh, I'm dead today. But this time, I was like, in fact, my mother has been waiting for mm-hmm. your call. Call them. Wow. And they were shocked. They were like, how, you know? And so, funny thing is, they gave me a great recommendation. They, they still told me, oh, but yeah. it's well, blah, blah, blah. Wow. I didn't really care for the recommendation yeah. because. In high school, I wasn't even in Kenya. Mm, okay. Yeah, so it's just like, ah, those things don't matter to me. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time, you know, it was one of those things where my dad was like, we are proud of you. You have taken a stand. And in life in general, when mm-hmm. somebody attacks you, you yeah. don't wait until your spirit is dead. Mm. And then you, you will end up doing something crazy. You attack the situation as is, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so that was the first time, to the best of my recollection, I can, you know, fully remember defending myself. Or actually coming into my own mm-hmm. after the bullying. Yeah, experience. and so when your when your mom, sorry, when your mom came, she went to school. Yeah, you said. Yeah. And then what what happened? So when she went to school, yeah. they told her, "Oh, Maria, we've never seen this reaction from Maria. You know, she's just always a very quiet, very smiley girl. We've never seen her being so aggressive." Mm-hmm. My mom was like, "You see, the thing is, when I we have been coming to school mm-hmm. for the last three years, mm-hmm. complaining that Mar- Maria is being bullied, you did nothing." Right, and so right now the girl has taken a stance. She's not going to tolerate, you know, the bullying. Mm-hmm. You seem more surprised by her aggression than the bullying, than the fact that I have complained and yeah. her father has complained over three, and even I have complained mm. to the teachers. You know, you get why? What? Why? What made you stay? The school was that good that it you wasn't s- good. Yeah, you that you stayed is, for three years. Yes. So you see, the thing is, it's one of those things where when you're about to do the Kenya Certificate of Primary Education, you don't want to move around. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. Exactly. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. one of those things where you're like, listen, it's like being in your last year of university and you're like let me shift let me here shift, yeah, you know true. it doesn't make sense mm-hmm. you know and so it was like i just decided to tolerate it and it's like you know i've taken it in for the last few years i'll take it in you know mm-hmm. but going back home to my parents and you know to my family my family has always made it very easy for me to exist in a very difficult world mm. Right, their love and affection has carried me through the most difficult most ridiculous yeah. of moments and it gives me a lot of confidence yeah, yeah. you did you did like during those times like that three years Mm -hmm. was there there was no one at all that you could confide in as far as your peers like there was not even a single adam where were you (laughs) (laughs) adam was quiet back those days used to be at the back i remember even where adam used to sit he used to sit one row away from the teacher at the back and i used to sit at the corner at the front over there (laughs) and you see the thing is i can understand even for example let's say adam wouldn't what was going against the kid exactly all the kids you go against the grain you know you'll be oh so you're being friends with her you know things like that but i would have one or two girls but even then, they understood that my value in that class was not very high. Mm. So if they felt the need to mishandle me in order to make themselves feel better, they could do it without consequence. I wasn't going to retaliate mm. because they're the only friends that I have. And at the same time, they would not be punished by their peers mm-hmm. because their peers already contribute to my misery. Yeah. Right? So it was a lose-lose situation yeah. for me in short. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Damn. <laughs> like how, and so like once once you did KCP, how, how did you do in KCP? I I'm did great. Yeah, yeah okay. I got like three A's and two B's and a C. Okay. So for somebody who was being like, yeah, ah, it yeah. was actually my dad was so impressed. My That's parents good. were very happy. Yeah. The fact that you're able to even study, like, <laughs> I, I don't think, but I guess it made you stronger. It you know did, what I mean? but it's not a strength that, that I would you choose yeah. if I had to go back. Exactly. Yeah. It's not a strength that you, you even like a child should have to no. think about having no like ideally no child should have to go through that exactly yeah. and at the same time i never thought i had anxiety and that was the birth of my anxiety mm. Social let's anxiety. talk about that yeah because yes. like 
I, I know for me, mine, mine was not that extreme mm-hmm. in terms of, but identifying the fact that I have anxiety to a degree mm-hmm. about certain things and realizing that the way certain things happened in school mm-hmm. and at home as a kid, like it matters. Like yes. you, when you talk about other people having problems mm-hmm. and them getting anxiety, right. it makes sense. Yeah. When you think of yourself, you're like, nah, there's no way exactly. like that <laughs> made me have anxiety. This yeah. must be something else. Yeah. But it's like, so w- when you moved to high school, mm-hmm. so now you're moving. Which country did you say you moved to? So what happened was that when I first finished in Riara, mm-hmm. th- I spent a year in Kenya. So I w- we didn't know we were going to move to the Middle East, right? okay. to, to Dubai, actually. Okay. So I did a semester at Nairobi Jeffries Academy. And then I did another semester mm-hmm. at Loreto Convent Msongari. Okay. But, but I had been, to, to, from first, I think from third grade, fourth grade, I was already in Msongari okay. when I was much, much younger, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But then I moved back for a semester in high school. And then after the minute, hi, uh, the last year ended, my dad got a transfer to Dubai. And that's when I moved. So I ended up repeating a year in high school because mm-hmm. it's like, you know, moving into the middle of the year, mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. it was kind of tricky. Yeah. 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 And in any case, I was within an age range where they like, just go back a year. Okay. And this, yeah. Was this your first trip out of the country? No. In life? no. So when I, <laughs> again, yeah. when I was in primary school, seventh grade, we went to the UK mm-hmm. for four months. And so, of course, again, another aspect of the bullying was that when I went to the UK, I, we came back, right? And the, my parents had communicated this to my teachers. And they were like, oh, uh, Maria will be homeschooled. I will homeschool her. So my pa- my mom actually homeschooled me. Mm. Uh, but then when I came back, they're like, are you sure you went to Ushago? You didn't go to Ushago? Are you sure uh, you didn't? Yes. And it was just one of those. Village, yeah, to the village. Who? I actually didn't go to the village for four months. But we actually were there. I, uh, we had lived in the UK for yeah, a year. Yeah, uh, my dad being away from us for four months was mm-hmm. unacceptable. Mm-hmm. You know, he, our, as, our, as a family, we were a very close, tight unit. And so he was like, you know what? <laughs> four months, doesn't matter. Pack your things. We're all going. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, so we went for those four months. But I never really associated with the greater English community, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. it was just my relatives that lived there, my, my aunt on my paternal side and her husband and, and the kids and everything, right? And it because I felt like I always had my parents mm. and my siblings, that that's as much as interesting or as, you know, as big my social circle got. Mm. And I had one best friend called Michelle. <laughs> yeah, and I still nice. have, you know, like yeah. we've been friends for like over 20 years now. Oh, that's awesome. yeah. So, uh, yeah, that was... The second time, I was more aware, I was more grown, Mm -hmm. right? And so with the social anxiety, it made me more stressed. Now, when I went to Nairobi Jeffries, that was also a very new community like mm. if you move from you know those so like an indian t- it's more of like it's a muslim school muslim school yeah, yeah so we sorry, had the okay. mosques and everything and mm-hmm. so on and so forth and it was a wonderful experience because i got to see because i always attended either a christian school or a catholic school mm-hmm. you know because i'm catholic right mm-hmm. so and but to be in a school where it, there's, it's a different denomination mm-hmm. was also a great experience and so i attended Nairobi jeffries and then there was this one time this kid did something that was it wasn't a big deal right it, i think we were busted with phones or something mm. like that mm-hmm. but it, the truth is i had my phone but mine didn't go off it was oh, her phone that went off damn. so the teacher was surveying the kids like whose phone went off the truth is it was hers not mine mm. but she tried to force me to accept that it was mine yeah. so that the teacher can have my. but then i was it, it the situation felt familiar the harassment mm. felt felt familiar mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right and i was like you know what maria the easiest way is for you to admit they take your phone mommy comes in the evening she'll take it back from them but I, there was something like no mm-hmm. we are not going to accept it i lost my mind more than i should have right mm. i became you know i went into a fit of rage and it was my reaction didn't wait yes, it was it not was as not yeah yeah exactly so yeah. even the kids were shocked like they're like whoa maria we didn't see that coming mm. it was just something so small that I, even even trying to explain themselves were you like you, sh- you shouted at the kid i shouted yeah. i threatened mm-hmm. i banged chairs and tables and everything but it was just because i can i thought of how i was treated back mm-hmm. then and so i familiar. swore yeah it, you know those three months before you joined high school after kcpe mm-hmm. That was my swearing stage. I swear that will not happen to me again, right? And so I went back home and I was like, I need to find a sustainable way to deal with conflict. Mm-hmm. Do you, that's something till today I struggle with. Wow. As much as I don't go into a fit of rage yeah. like I used to. Yeah, it's totally the opposite. <laughs> yeah. no. Now for me, it's more of like when I realize that something's about to get very tense and I normally sever ties. Mm. I block the person off. Like, you don't exist to me anymore. You could be dead for all I know. 
we we don't associate mm-hmm. and so i have done i did that up until i think a year and a half ago or a year and so now i had to go back to my old relationships that i did that mm. to find a sustainable le- le- listen conflict is normal confrontation mm-hmm. is normal mm-hmm. let's see how we can maneuver through this yeah. I, because of that experience and that's why I told that thing that bullying mm-hmm. it it manifests itself Nasty. in my life till today in different ways so those are things i'm still trying to curb how do i deal with this how do i deal with that you know uh, yeah when so. i got to high school my so of course you know i managed to deal with the bullying one way or another right but then when i got to high school my body just it just became what it became, mm-hmm. right? I was just pear shaped. Mm-hmm. There was no way Curves. around it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but you know, at the time, Kim Kardashian was not you. Yeah, right? so it, it, wasn't, not, it wasn't. It was Paris Hilton. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. Nicole Kidman. <laughs> yeah. You know, those, those three, generation. exactly, right? Yeah. Naomi Campbell, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so I, when I was in Dubai, I attended a school called Jumeirah English Speaking School. And 4,000 British students, three Kenyan kids, mm. of which two is my sister and I. Mm. Right, and so pressure, 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 pressure. You know, these kids look skinny. These kids, you know, rah, they have European these British eggs, of beauty. beauty yeah. Exactly. <laughs> they, my name, my hair is kinky, and I'm struggling to even find saloons. Yeah. You know, in this area, and they yeah. know the saloons in Dubai. You know, you would have to go to the very sketchy side of Dubai, mm. old Dubai, mm. but you know, very sketchy sides. You know, to, to find, find a saloon. You know, so you would have to drive away from the suburbia all the way there. You know, mm. and now when they see you with their car there, they charge you more mm. because mm. <laughs> so it's a whole thing. You know, and so you get there, and you know the kids are fascinated by you, and now I'm coercing myself to speak in a British accent, mm. right? So during uh, the first three periods of class, I'm like, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you, it got to break time. I think my brain forgot. <laughs> eh? Ah? What do you want? <laughs> I want juice. I want juice. And biscuits. And, <laughs> and crisps. <Yeah. laughs> you know, and they're like, oh my God, Maria, your accent is absolutely lovely. Eh? Which, <laughs> one? Which, accent? Which, accent? Which one? Which one? The old one or the new one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? And so that's, uh, that's one of the things I was like, you know what, let me just stick to what I know. <laughs> and then I'll, you know, we'll see how it goes. So, yeah. It was good and everything, but I always was under a lot of pressure mm, physically. Mm. So I started eating salads. I wasn't really eating, right? So I was eating salads. I would go home. I would stop eating by 4 p.m. Mm. Then the whole night I would just walk and everything. And it was very unhealthy, mm. right? I'm very, unhealthy. very, very unhealthy. And I did every diet in the book. And also at the same time, my skin was not helping, mm. right? You know, you know, when you're a child, you have that problematic skin. I hadn't figured out what's wrong with me and ABCD. Mm-hmm. But... That's what resulted in me spending a lot of time indoors. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I never have to worry about, you know, oh, you know, people and so on and so forth. I would go to school. I would get my grades. I would be a nice person. I had that one friend. <laughs> and I remember her name was Olivia. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. So that carried me through my time there. Right. Yeah. And after that, my parents decided, hmm, let's yeah. buy a house. We're like, oh, let's buy a house. So yeah. we, they bought a house in the outskirts of Dubai. A, a nice place, big pool, A, B, C, D. So they're like, you know, you can spend as much time as you want indoors. Mm. At least you have the comfort of your home. And so they were like, but the only problem was the bus that would take me to Jumeirah English Speaking School mm-hmm. was no longer coming to the outskirts of Dubai. I would have to go to a nearby school. So I went to a school called Nibras. Mm-hmm international school so my mom was actually very happy because she was like it's an american curriculum maria you know it's a much tougher system than the ib i don't know why my family believed that mm. Whoa, <laughs> but that was, IB? IB yeah tough, exactly you know? so you know yeah. like, when michael did ib that's when yeah. he realized michael my brother yeah, yeah. that's when he realized ib was actually tougher than AP. Then, <laughs> uni level work yeah. exactly and so that's like okay you know what we must have gotten that wrong then and then i get the school so at the back of my head you know as a rule of thumb before you join a school Go visit it. Mm. So us, we're just one of those people. We went online, filling out applications, paid mm. everything. But did you go to see the school? No. So I show up the school. It's an American school. The demographic is 95% Arab. Mm. From different parts of the Gulf and different parts of North Africa, right? So that really didn't bother me because I felt like unlike this British school that I was in where there were very many Europeans, mm-hmm. there was a the cultural similarity. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And I wasn't bullied at the British school. They were, mm. they were nice. Others were pretentiously nice. <laughs> you know, but for whatever reason, yeah. it worked for me. Yeah. It was, it, it sufficed. At least they left you alone. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and that was wonderful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I went to the Arab school and... First day of school, hostility. 
right? There were two black people in that school, mm. in that class, of which I was one of them. And the other one was a Sudanese guy. Mm. And so the Sudanese guy was from Northern Sudan. Of course, mm. he was in South Sudan. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, with North Sudan, their culture is very similar to mm-hmm. their Arab mm-hmm. culture, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Those yeah. who speak Arabic and so on and so forth. And immediately I felt like an outcast. And mm. the other two, and the other, other kids who felt, who are different mm-hmm. were those one who was from uh, South Korea and there's mm. one who was from Japan. Actually, she was so, half Japanese, yeah. half uh, Pakistani. Very so interesting they had, their, yeah, yeah. they had their own little... Exactly thing. So they were also very quiet. So I decided, let me just kind of pledge oh, okay. my allegiance to you okay, guys. Okay. You know, you, you, when you go to school, you try and find a circle just yeah. so, you know. Just to exist. Exactly. Yeah. In that space. Yeah. And that's what I did. But oddly enough, with high school, my confidence levels were much higher. Yeah. Like, it was one of those things where I didn't care if I were alone. It didn't bother me. I had already selected parts of the school yeah. where, where I you was, like, go. chill, you know. Yeah. And if you come at me, rest assured, I will come at you. Mm. Right? And so, that because I noticed the hostility from day one, that's when I made my decision. Like mm-hmm. That you know, quick. Yeah, it's like, quick, you know what, yeah. this one is going to be difficult and I will have to discipline this situation. Mm-hmm. Right? Question. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead, go but, ahead. like, how much of that has has manifested into something that's not serving you? Because I feel like, like you said, it's so quick to be like shut down. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. But like, other times you feel like maybe, I guess you did mention some of your relationships you revisited to yeah. fix that. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So yeah. it's a, like a balancing act. Yeah. Okay. And so, and and the reason why is is because I when somebody. I wouldn't want to say misbehave, but because you never know what propels somebody to have behave a particular way. But when somebody shows any level of hostility towards me, my, you know, mm. Pavlovian response is, you know what? I am going to do this yeah. to you and I am going to put you in your place. You will know your place in my life, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Either you're non-existent or you will exist within certain limits. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But the when I came to college, and this is something I have learned in the last year or so, we have to speak it out, right? I need to understand where you're coming from with the way you're behaving. And if I still notice that you're still being, you know, difficult and so on and so forth, like, listen, this mm-hmm. relationship is not by force, you know, so I could, you could just cut it off, right? But back then, that wasn't, you know, my resolution. I'll, and then at the same time, my sister was a year below me, so mm-hmm. she was in a class opposite me. And then down the hallway was a, another Kalenjin girl, Betty. Oh, Kalenjin is a tribe in Kenya. Yes, for those uh, who don't exactly. Know. Yeah. And yeah, and so it was more like the Powerpuff Girls, the <laughs> three black Powerpuff Girls, you know. <laughs> and people hated us. Oh, we were we were literally like a handful of black students in that school, mm-hmm. of which we were non-Arab, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So my sister, myself, and Betty were we were very tough personalities mm. like they would sometimes those kids would try and really like mess with us and we would really retaliate so it's almost like you are a minority in mm. this school mm. what gives you the right to retaliate to mm-hmm. that degree we got we used to get very aggressive particularly betty because betty had lived in dubai much longer than mm. i did right mm. so she, and she was older than myself and naomi my sister so she would defend us right and at the same time she spoke arabic so i realized well, you know, some, they would say certain things in Arabic. Or mm. sometimes what would happen is that we would, even in English class, they would speak in Arabic, surely, mm. you know. And so it, what, would, what for me was like, I need to learn this language so that any time we go and report something to the teacher and yeah, they're exactly. speaking in Arabic, yeah. even I know what they're mm. saying. Now, much to my surprise, I realized Swahili, the Kenyan language, it's is 45% yep. Arabic. Yep. Now, picking up on, on the language was, was very easy for yeah. me. I learned, I had an Egyptian friend uh, who we fell out much later on, but she taught me how to write. She taught me how to read. She taught wow. me how to speak. Yeah. Everything you I needed to Arabic? learn. I can't speak Arabic. Yeah. Yeah. I'm intermediate, of okay. course. But, you know, the longer I've lived away from there, you know, mm. I don't You already have, know what I'm about to ask. Yeah. Can you give us some, <laughs> give us a line or two? <laughs> uh, okay, so for example, you can say, welcome to Vancouver. So, ahlan, sahlan. Okay. Ana esmeg Maria. So, like, just those small, small yeah, things, yeah, you yeah. know. That's cool. Yeah. I've never met a Kenyan who knows Arabic. Yeah. I mean, a, a non-Muslim Kenyan that's... Speaks Arabic, Arabic yeah, yeah. yeah. So, then there are different dialects to it. So, she was Egyptian. So, mm. she taught me the Egyptian dialect. Uh, uh, dialects. So, they would say things like, for example, you know, how to say a car in Egypt in, in Egyptian Arabic would be different. That how to mm. say a car in, you know, like the Arabic that's spoken in the Gulf. Mm-hmm. So, they would say Arabia yeah. and they would say something else mm-hmm. on the other side. And so, she taught me all those differences. And so, back then, given that you're hearing it being spoken a lot, 
you know, also you pick up on it, mm-hmm. right? So when they would go and say, oh, Maria, uh, so on and so forth, also me, I would go there with my Arabic, yeah. broken, it's broken. <laughs> yeah, but it works. It works. Yeah. It's good enough for yeah. me to get my point across. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think we would go back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then, but that they were, the kids were like, you cannot put her down. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so much so in the hallway, they would see me coming. Yeah. They clear. Let me tell you those things. used to, And they fed into something else. That's a problem again, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. They fed into a certain power that yeah. started to grow I was inside ask of about me. That. Yeah. yeah, it was like the fact that these kids cleared the hallway when mm-hmm. they see me coming in was like, you know, mm-hmm. you know, now I'm mm-hmm. that kid, you know. Mm-hmm. And I excused that because I'm like, I they was the one it. who used to be stepped on back yeah. then, but now I deserve this kind of. So that fizzled out because I didn't like entertaining it. And you know, my sister is very, you know, she's gives great advice. She kept so you accountable. Exactly. She how was, uh, how did you what what tell, take me back to that moment uh-huh. where she snapped you back into like you you're drunk off of this power. So it was it was a conversation that I I, I think I must have been having with my mom. I was like in the car and I'm talking like, mommy, nowadays people fear me. Oh. <laughs> now is like now is like Maria, be careful. Pride counts before a fall. A fall yeah. yeah. You don't want to gain that level of pride from, you know, of course, I used to kind of frustrate these kids to a certain degree because, mm-hmm. and just to keep them at bay. Yeah, You know, sure. one yeah. of those things where when you say something, I really roar at yeah. you. The, you yeah. know, the thing is, like, with kids, like, it's just pure survival. Yes. It's not, and it's, high it's school no was just, Exactly. Yeah. Primary school, high school was purely survival and it's something I never really understood, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And so I had to like be hostile towards them just to keep them at bay. Yeah, yeah. So you know, you just don't mess with You me. don't want to do exactly. it, but you kind of have exactly, to. Exactly, yeah. you know? Yeah. And yeah, that was high school and uh, it was fine. And then after Nibras, I moved to an American school, another American school. I did one year. So <laughs> they make you pay a fee for a whole year mm. because they know in case you have to, at that yeah. time, you're not going to, my, yeah, my yeah. dad was like, you're not going to leave my money, finish it. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so I was like, after this year, and the one thing my parents gave me after the bullying experience mm-hmm. was the privilege to choose mm-hmm. uni- schools. Mm-hmm. They were just like, just get us the fee structure, get us, you know, the information that we need, but you can go to whichever school you want to mm-hmm. go. You choose, because your well-being is important. So I attended another school called K-12 International mm-hmm. Academy, right? And at K-12, it was a very good school. It was a virtual school, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, so I, I used to they email you boxes of books and ah. experiments and everything all the way from the States, okay. actually Virginia, and then it comes to your house, or there comes the K-12 center in Dubai. Yeah, I've never heard of this before. Yeah, it's actually, yeah. it's like the new way kids are going to school now, like the digital age and everything. Yeah, okay. And so we, I, we, I'd be at home, and I'm just Skyping with my teacher, and, you know, ABC, that's how I did my... And then... The only problem was, and this is why I'm never graduate. I'm not uh, excited for graduation. I never actually graduated high mm, school. You okay. know that whole cap and everything. Yeah. And and I guess I mean I never had that either. Yeah. But I had. I, there was a thing though. Uh, yeah. There was a thing. There was prom. Exactly. There was like I never a did prom either. Ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. There were. N- I never attended any form of ceremonies mm. in. Uh, you know, in my academia mm. life, right? Except my, probably my uh, catechism and, you know, what, 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 Holy oh, Communion. Holy Communion. That was, <laughs> at the time for me, I was going to school at Loreto Convent in Songari. It only made sense, mm. right? It's already a Catholic school. And my parents were like, you know, attend catechism, which I was already doing. And so for me, having my Holy Communion was just one of those, by the ways. Everybody was having it. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And that was as exciting as, or as, as, as uh, ceremonious as my yeah. academic life yeah. got, right? And yeah. so... I didn't actually do the whole cup and thing in uh, uh, high school, but the perk was that Hillary Clinton got to sign our diploma. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, that thing serves you. You, you know, I you, used, oh, yeah, yeah, I bet, you right? apply anyway, and you just like, you want to see my diploma. <laughs> 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 and that's when she was Secretary of State. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. And then after that, I, I finished high school. And still, you know, you, you make progress. Th- that last year and a half, I was at doing virtual learning. It didn't help with my social skills mm-hmm. because, again, I'm back home, you know, the comfort of my family, you know, and, and you, you let people into your space, mm-hmm. and this is your space. You mm-hmm. control the mm-hmm. variables, mm-hmm. right? Most of the time, I didn't. Mm. And so we moved back to Kenya in twenty end of 2012, actually mid-2012. And, you know, we moved to Karen, and then my dad's gotten a new job, so he shifted from Barclays to Standard Chartered Bank. And then my siblings are back in school, and Naomi is finishing her last year of the virtual learning. Mm. And again, I'm not really associating with anyone 
family, strictly family. And, but then again, my family lives far away from Karen, mm. right? So they live in, others who live in Langata, they're also busy. They can't keep showing yeah. up. There are yeah. others who live in South B and South C and so on and so forth. So they can't also keep showing up at, you know, when I want people mm-hmm. around. Mm-hmm. And then the big moment came. UBC. Now, I oh. got accepted into U of T and UBC. Okay. But my dad was like, you know, UBC is a better fit. What was the, what was that, why did you choose Canada in the first place? In fact, oddly enough, Canada wasn't even an option for me. Mm-hmm. The plan was for the States. Right? I applied to Yeah, because it was an American, you had yes. come from an American. AP, actually, and I did the SATs, mm-hmm. and I did even SAT1, SAT2. I was priming myself for that American college life, mm-hmm. right? But around that time, uh, when we were shifting from uh, Dubai to Nairobi, mm-hmm. my dad's CEO at the bank, his, he has six daughters. I think two or three of his daughters attend UBC Okanagan. Okay. Right? And so when he mentioned, oh, by the way, my daughter's just finished high school, and she's looking into college. And mm-hmm. then he recommended. He was like, oh, Maria should try UBC. And then he just came home like, Maria, everybody seems, seems to be talking you know, pretty well about Canada. Why don't you try it out? I always felt like Canada was one of, you know, it's like the little brother who's not excited. Yeah, it's like, it's, know, like, it's like Pepsi. Really? It's Canada? Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, it's like <laughs> the, the States Stoker, is America. Yeah. Is, the States is Coke. Coke and, and then Canada, Canada is Pepsi, Pepsi yeah. yeah. I'm like, Canada, but it sounds like a farmland. <laughs> 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 I, yeah, that was you know yeah. you, when you know you, you, I was ignorant, right? Yeah. So I was too. Like, yeah. dude, I don't. Th- I think the only thing I knew about Canada was Justin Bieber and, and like you know even snow. that even that I didn't know, but yeah. I knew the snow. Yeah, I always knew. People always talked about you know like terrible Canadian weather, mm. and so I decided you know what? Let me just try this UBC. Mm-hmm. And so it was around uh, election time in mm-hmm. Kenya. Mm-hmm. I decided let me just apply and we see. So I got into both of them, U of T and mm-hmm. UBC. And then at U of T, I got into the Woodward uh, School of Economics or whatever that was, right? Mm. Directly. But at UBC, they would make me apply into the faculty. Mm. That changed the game for me. That's how I got into math. Okay. And, <laughs> and so I came here and it was an interesting experience initially. First, when you've arrived, th- there was a Jumpstart program. Mm. Now, at Jumpstart... My parents have paid everything. They're like, okay, now go sleep in that dorm in Toten and everything. Yeah. I refused. Okay. I would, it would get to evening. So they were sleeping at Marine Drive. Mm. I refused to leave my mom's bed. So my dad would have to walk all day from Marine Drive to wow. the other side of campus to sleep. And Whoa. bear in mind, the guy had booked that. Yeah. Room. He's probably like, oh, this kid. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know. What was the, so like you were just not trying I was to, not ready. Yeah. Like that shift, like people. Moving from one town to another in your own country is one thing, mm. but moving halfway across the world, mm. I have no family, and that's how I moved to you know Vancouver with no one around me, literally. And my parents brought me. Of course, they're trying to you know help me. Enculturate you slowly. Exactly, yeah, yeah. and you know it's one of those things. And how long did they stay before they went back? They were here for two weeks. With two me. weeks, okay. Mm-hmm. It, they didn't, I didn't even come with clothes. They were like, you just leave everything. We'll just shop for you when you get there. Mm-hmm. And so they were v- trying to be very accommodating and trying to help me, you know, uh, you know, enter the society, That's right? Good. So, so the first time I arrived, um, my mom called Benna, Benna Peters. I'm not sure whether you know her name. Is. Yeah, Benna Peters is a Ghanaian girl, and she's the first person my mom, she was in the in Jumpstart welcoming group. Mm-hmm. My mom called her, like, you know, to help me integrate and everything. And so she was so nice to me. Until today, I remember Benna mm-hmm. like that, mm-hmm. right? Because and after that, you know, I've never really spoken to her because you know she was much much older. She okay. ended up graduating and everything, but she was very very kind to me, very kind. And my mom w- always remembers her for that reason. How's that, you know, slim Ghanaian girl who yeah. helped you? And so when Benna helped me, I went took my things and then I went to my dorm, right? And so my parents said goodbye the next day and they left. So it was now me trying to figure myself mm-hmm. in Vancouver. Mm-hmm. I didn't show up to any of those jumpstart things. Yeah. Wow. I did not. And in, it's, I was scared. I showed up yeah. like two or three, but those outside events, let's take you to na- Richmond Night Market, let's take you to you this, of none yeah. of them. Yeah. And I, one of the reasons was because, again, I went into the jumpstart group itself, and then you could see the clicks for me. Mm. And then the trauma mm-hmm. begins. Yeah, it, and then it's, it's, just, oh, oh. it's so bad. And right? even at 20, you're yeah, still it's like, still there. it's yeah. still eating you. Yeah. You know, you can already see, you know, and the way the kids organize themselves, You, the cool kids were on one yeah, side, the tell. weirdos were on one yep, side, yep. the non-English speakers were on the yep, other yep. side, and now Maria, we are lost. Where are you? Yeah, we are like, lost where do you exist? Again. Yeah, yeah. So you try and say something to the cool kids, literally, they all look down upon you like, 
you know, even it's almost that look where the fact that you even have the audacity to, to speak, speak to, to us, us is problematic. Yeah. Okay, so that conversation died. Now I met two girls, Noemi Fernandez and Chanda Mahajan. So these are shout out to my girls, honestly. They mm. made my undergrad very easy, mm. very tolerable, mm. you know. Mm. And so we got together, and the three of us from like another papa, <laughs> you know, <laughs> of minority papa. <laughs> <laughs> hilarious. I've never heard of that. that the minority before. papa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can already see it in yeah, my head yeah. right now. Like. <laughs> So that it was nice, but then we got together, we would go out and everything. And again, very supportive group of mm-hmm. people, right? And so, but the problem was, you know, we never had the same majors. And Chanda left, one of the girls left uh, UBC, I think a year into schooling. Mm. She decided to do hospitality, but she was just within Vancouver, so we could always hang out. Mm-hmm. So I, I, you know, I now again, the problem, identity. Mm. Now, ad- identity for me wasn't a, something that I thought of for a very long time. Right, I always knew that I was Maria, but I didn't know I was black and African, mm-hmm. so, and Kenyan yeah. and Korea yeah. and all these things. Yeah. I knew I was Korea when I was in Kenya because you know the tribalism Tribals, is, yeah? Yeah, yeah. But here, I never had to think of myself as Maria, oh, the black girl. Yeah, yeah. It never occurred to me. So even my associations to people were, it had that naivete to it. Yeah, right. Because right? you're like, I mean, for like, you. It's so weird because like I always have this thing where. It's it's always hard to kind of express this because I, I don't want to sound like I'm putting racism on people. Yeah. I'm not saying it's racism. No, 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 no. I'm just saying like as a, that experience of encountering people from other cultures, especially as a black person, because mm-hmm. visually it's like obvious you're not from. Mm-hmm. You can tell that like, oh, mm-hmm. I don't know what to do with you. Exactly. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> Lion King. I don't, like, I, it's <laughs> like, yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, yeah. And you know, I realized they have to get over... People in general have to get over your blackness mm-hmm. before they actually see you as a person. And there's a way, what I used to do is that I have to find a branch, something yeah. that can connect. Uh, you know, what, have you ever watched Avatar? Where they, no, they move those things over there and then they connect it to something yeah, okay. to form a certain unity. Okay. So I had to find something that would connect me to them or say, oh, like, I really love sports car. Yeah, like, you know, when I used to be in Dubai, we would go to Abu Dhabi for F1. Oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. You know? It's, uh, and it's just like, okay, now I found connective tissue. Let's, let's <laughs> yeah, keep yeah, this yeah. going. Yeah, yeah. Let's keep this alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. And it gets exhausting because there's some people you have nothing, nothing in yeah, common. No. <laughs> it's like, wow, I wow, saw so the weather today, though. Right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. That's, that's so many people That here. redundant yeah. conversation, mm-hmm. that monotonous, annoying conversation about the weather. And mm-hmm. so I decided, let me look for an African community because identity was huge. Mm. And it, it hit me the first two weeks of mm. school, mm-hmm. right? How I need to find people who are similar to myself. So I joined the African Awareness Initiative and it was a very good, you know, it helped me psychologically in the sense that there were people who looked like me in a space that no one looks like me. Yeah. Right? And mm-hmm. even if, okay, so AI was pre- predominantly, you know, West Africa. Yeah, right? that's like another feel, thing, yeah. right? That you didn't think of yourself as an no, East Africa. Exactly. It's like, what is being East Africa? Exactly. Yeah. And, and so much so that the summer, the December that I went home, I had so many. West African tendencies, mm. even how I spoke and yeah. how I cooked, until my mom was like, Maria, did we take you to Nigeria <laughs> or did we take you to Vancouver? Yeah. Like, what happened? Yeah. And it's just like, I can't help it because yeah. it's who I'm surrounded mm-hmm. by. Now, trying to find my identity as a person mm-hmm. and also as a black person and also as an African, those were layers yeah. I was just struggling yeah. through, right? Yeah. But the, the AI was, you know, was supportive in the sense that yeah. at least I didn't have to think too much about my blackness yeah. when yeah. I was around oh, them. African Awareness Initiative. Initiative yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, and so I I vied for a position as VP Marketing, of which, of which I got, mm-hmm. and I, you know, was assisting with the whole, you know, marketing for their events and everything. Mm-hmm. And then... Shortly after, of course, I had friends, you know, whom we were friends <laughs> while we were doing AAI. Mm-hmm. And then we decided to move in together. Now, as a rule of thumb, I realized do not move in with your friends. Friends, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. For some people, it goes for the better. In my case, it became for the worst, mm. right? And I feel like there was a particular friendship with a very lovely girl who I was, you know, we were very good friends. We were almost like two sides of a coin. Mm. And unfortunately, we fell out so badly that I have... 
you know it was a, a, a heartbreak you would think she was like a boyfriend or something <laughs> the heartbreak was yeah. so intense that yeah. you know i stopped eating spicy food Whoa. yeah because that was our thing yeah. right? i stopped you know listening to sakodie because <laughs> that was our thing wow. yeah okay. every time i listened to, to but Sakodier, it makes sense also because you know? of where you were at that it, time and at yeah. the time i had no mm-hmm. family right mm-hmm. so she was my sister here mm. and everybody knew we were as tight as tight can be right but you know we end up making up and everything and it, it's she she left Vancouver for better opportunities elsewhere okay. yeah so but it was fine later on but it was one of those things where i also had to learn how to be myself now that's when the depression kicked in mm-hmm. cuz what is that yeah what's it's that space like, it's like what oh my god it's so weird that you described it that way yeah. cuz like that's when depression kicks exactly. in exactly yeah. and you know the worst part was that that sp- that time where I again I didn't have a sustainable way of dealing with mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. I I started cutting people off. Yeah. Now you start cutting people off, mm. then you find yourself alone. alone yep. You find yourself alone and it's reading break and yeah. you're alone and you have nowhere to go. You've locked your doors. You're ordering Domino's day and night. It's just it I picked up my phone and I called the suicide center. Oh wow. And it was but you know whatever propelled me to do that and the lady was talking but i'm just like you know you know the mental health is not a thing in africa it's just like mm-hmm. one of those things mm-hmm. that they just yep. then later on that part of me kicking i'm like ah what am i Major, doing yeah, switched off what is yeah <laughs> or in africa or cu- in african culture or mm-hmm. kenyan culture in general it's just like mental health canadians mm-hmm, <laughs> mental true. health mm-hmm. is not a thing a thing like it's like dude we don't care about how you feel no. we don't care like like you having an experience and it changes you Mm-mm. it's just you being soft exactly period. exactly yeah. you're told to toughen up you mm-hmm. know you're told uh, there's that thing where you know maria if other people had the opportunities you had mm-hmm. they would have done more with it than mm-hmm. you're currently doing with mm-hmm. what you you know you're busy complaining you're being a softy everybody goes through a hard time and you and hearing those things makes you start thinking that There's, There's something, wrong, something with wrong with me. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Why am I being so soft? Why am I being this? Why am I be- and that was the beginning of my quote unquote suicidal thoughts. Because it is at the because you know the very same way I'm quick to end it with people. I also wanted to end with it with yourself, myself, yeah. you know. Yeah. Again, it's just it was a very interesting experience. And so school started, thank God the ne- the, co- the coming year, my sister came. And I had to move off campus, mm-hmm. which was good for me. That was academically speaking or even in any context it was the best decision that I made for mm-hmm. myself because sometimes being surrounded by friends your age who are going through the same things and they are exuding certain energies mm-hmm. or certain even their hostilities might not be a byproduct of them hating you it's, what it's just through, what they're yeah, going through yeah. but my sister is you know she's my sister right Naomi has come from the comforts of home she is here to me a pillar of mm. that affection and confidence and so on and so forth that I experience at home and as a person she has a very strong personality Naomi has always been a solo rider you know a lone wolf and that's where you know that's who she is right and i always admire that about her like how she can in this world you could all disappear and always alone herself and she doesn't care mm-hmm. and so living with her gave me confidence mm. when people would try and like you know mishandle me Naomi would be at the back Tell her this, tell her this. <laughs> and after me, I'm shouting over the phone. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, what do I say? What do I say? What do I say? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and you know, she would not tolerate people bullying me, and she would always, you know, coerce me to mm. be aggressive Stand and assertive. Yourself. You know, and that did something for mm. me, right? And it, her lone wolf character also helped me be alone and be okay, mm. right? And it, it was it was good. And so, again, another thing then living with family is that. You know when you're living with your parents and all your siblings the dynamics are different because the authority are your parents. But now when you're living with your siblings and the uh, and the authority is no longer there mm. like presently with yeah, you. There's no now structure. Exactly, yeah. Now you have to form your own relationship yeah, with them. Yeah. So we also had a bit of our back and forth but then they have been very helpful in you know building my character as a person. Mm-hmm. So after you know going through school and everything also relationships were not easy mm. now mm. man dating in hey, vancouver talk about it <laughs> let me tell you it's one of those things so when we first arrived my you know, i was not excited for dating at all because mm-hmm. i like i said i had a lot of confidence issues mm. right and so for me it was almost like if somebody showed interest you know you have an underlying yep, interest over there yeah exactly it's yep. like oh you need to step back a little but then i enjoyed being in a space where i could like someone 
but there was no commitment. Mm. I could go back to my life, mm-hmm. but I like you and I want us to have a thing. But just but not, not yeah. don't get too close. But you know, you can't really form those kind of rules in a typical relationship, right? But then in and they used to have, you know, a bunch of crushes, but that's where it used to end. In my second year, I fell for a, you know, I fell for someone and he was I had that comfort of being okay, this is my space, mm. and then I will like you within this vicinity, and then when I go home, you're non-existent mm, to me. Mm. And for two years, that was the case. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I, it's one of the things that I really enjoyed about that whole situation, right? And also, what, uh, what used to help was the fact that there was never a solid, solid, you know, fully solid understanding. Like, it's not one of those things where, but sometimes I would want more. And then sometimes I'm like, eh, not yeah. really. And that you know, doesn't work yeah, in a relationship. Exactly. You can't have it like you that. You can't have it yeah. both ways, mm-hmm. you know. And so, and then, you know, he ended up moving on and everything and so on and so forth. Broke my heart and everything. But at the same time, I'm like, my, you are indecisive in that time. A- and it's, and I realized it's okay to be indecisive. You know, to some degree, but just don't involve anyone. other people. That's the thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I told myself, so long as you don't know what you want and you don't have that capacity. And sometimes I think about it. You know, the way I live with my siblings. Can I imagine myself living with somebody who's not my family to that extent and love them like they, you know, and also and be like my husband and so on and so forth? The truth is no. no. That is the solid truth, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I feel like I'm not there yet. I have never been there. I am currently not there and I'm not sure how long it will take me to get there. But when I do, I will make the, you know, it will not be one of those let's date for 10 years, then get married. No. Yeah. And it's this is how, so a lot of my friends got into relationships early into UBC. Like, do you know how many bottles of wine I have carried and boxes of tissue? Because guys broke up. Right? Right? And I told them it's because when at this age, mm-hmm. discovering yourself is not easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Figuring out what I like, what I don't like, how, how I even feel about, you know, you there was a time in my life you could harass me, you could even abuse me, and I still wouldn't know. Wouldn't know, yeah. You know, I just like, oh, maybe that's just their behavior. Mm. But you, and it happened even at, at UBC. Somebody, but you know, the, uh, the the harassment I was receiving was not that overt one in your face mm. where somebody's trying to slap it's you around. It's emotional. Exactly. It's that emotional, over, you know, overwhelming emotionally. But I didn't know, mm-hmm. right? And then mm-hmm. later on, you grow up and you're like, eh, this person, this is, this is toxic. you are not, yeah, yeah, you are not being a good friend to me. You are mm-hmm. being, you know, tasteless. And so, in, it's important you go through that on your own mm-hmm. because my friends who went through it with their boyfriends, like two, have managed to you know break out. break that uh, you know space and now they are into that whole grown folk thing mm-hmm. and they are getting married and mm-hmm. everything. But ma- majority more people often are. than not, it doesn't work out. It does not. It's like ch- um, what do you call it? Uh, childhood sweethearts exactly. and all that. Exactly. Like there's only a handful of people who can have a childhood sweetheart. Exactly. And unfortunately, I feel like. I, I feel like a lot of people carry that childhood sweetheart mentality yeah. where it's like childhood sweetheart, high school sweetheart, or like if it's not high school sweetheart, it's like university sweetheart, sweetheart yeah. and everyone in uni. I remember that. I remember like thinking about that just uh-huh. like when you come to Vancouver, everyone has a boyfriend bo- or girlfriend. And that's the pressure came from there. Man. The pressure came from there because for also me, I was it, it was a very weird space to be in because it's like I'm insecure. I don't want him. But everybody seems to have one. Mm. So where do I stand? You know? And so, but at the same time, it's just like, I don't, I never had that type of, um, like, like I said, I had a lot of crushes. Yeah. And, you know, a lot but of that moves. wasn't your focus. No. Yeah. It's just a bunch of flings. You know, those things that I felt that would boost my confidence <laughs> here and there. Yeah. And I was just like, listen, <laughs> I need to find a way to boost my own ego yeah, without somebody telling me, at mm-hmm. you, oh, you're pretty and things like those, you know? So, uh yeah, so that's that was it, and uh, that also after the whole two year situation with that particular guy, I decided ah, I need to control how I feel about these relationships, right? So my mom always told me, Maria, don't uh, be in a hurry because you'll be married longer than you'll be unmarried. Mm. Right? Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Exactly. She's always like, you'll be married longer than you'll be unmarried, so don't be in a rush, per se, right? Because uh, I've always felt, felt like my mom, if there, there are things that she wanted to do with her life, but she never got to do it because, you know, she single-handedly pulled a family of 12 out of poverty. Yeah. My mom is a third of 12 children, right? And so my grandfather was a warden in Kisumu, a, a, a prison warden. Mm. And my grandmother was just a regular housewife. She used to be a businesswoman to sell food and so on and so forth. 
but they never really used to make ends meet to mm. fully especially after my grandfather retired from Kisumu and they moved back to the village you mm-hmm. know now to the Kuria region right yeah. and so they had a hard time financially so much so that my mom's my mom and her siblings would be sent to Marsabit to not so that ha- their aunties could take care of them so my mom got a job at Kenya Commercial Bank mm. at the age of 18 Wow. Yeah, and she was she's you know she had finished college by then and so on and so forth and so she started working. And back then in the 80s or early 80s late 70s if you make around 3000 Kenya shillings a month it's equivalent to like 300,000 mm. which is equivalent to $3000 today. Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. That was a lot of lot money. Of money yeah. yeah, and but she would send all the money back home. And so by that she pretty much took all her siblings through college. Wow. All of them. Wow. And then my with you know in unity with my father yeah. gave all of them jobs wow so nobody the poverty ended yeah. that cycle of wow. poverty where you know right now should be giving people money for no yeah. reason no more wow. everybody's in school everybody has an international job they're all bankers wow. and everything that's so cool exactly and yeah. so it's amazing you know mm-hmm. her strength like my father is extremely wise i cannot i don't know anybody god then daddy <laughs> and then but my mom her yeah. strength is an parallel mm-hmm. i have never seen anything like it and so i take their both their counsels very seriously so when my mom my mom always told me there are certain things i wish i had done at your age i wish i traveled more i wish i became a lawyer she became a banker she still enjoyed it and everything 20 years but then it was not out of choice it was out of necessity right it was necessary she enjoyed it yeah but then she wish she made certain decisions where she made certain choices for, for herself, herself yeah. exactly and at the same time she couldn't live for herself when you hear to oh six of your siblings are all you know admitted in hospital mm. and they're all sick and everything mm. and so you can't she can't even eat yeah. right yeah. so she had to take money and you know and so on and so forth brilliant brilliant woman and so she always encourages my sister and I to not to be in a hurry for relationships not to be in a hurry for marriage or children and so on and so forth those are things that will come mm. but The reason why she emphasizes it is because we don't want to look at our children and be like I wish I did this. Yeah. You stop me from doing this. Mm-hmm. And ABC she doesn't do that to us but yeah. she's like I'm not you. You might have that resentment towards your children. So live your life mm-hmm. and exhaust it, you know. Just be what you want to be. Have the power that you want to have in so on and so forth. Yeah. Amazing. Exactly. Yeah. So it's one of those things where you want to make sure that the people that come into your life after you are certain of who at least not fully certain because every day is a learning process right but at least you're solid about the key things that make you who you yeah. are you will uh, you know m- society has always taught us that you must come into my life to add value otherwise mm. you're not adding value that's out. true but then, right. for me you will come to my life and you will enjoy the value that i have added into myself and this is why and uh, one of the reasons why i'm you know pretty sad if you know i decide to leave vancouver i'm leaving and i have found a group of people who i'm giving yeah. myself to yeah. right yeah. my i'm enjoying a lot of time with my siblings right now and i'm enjoying a lot of time with my friends and especially our circle of mm-hmm. friends and everything and so i'm um, because i'm at that point where i have added value mm. a lot of value mm-hmm. to myself mm-hmm. i have added a lot of worth and so many things and now i'm giving it and people are enjoying it and we are enjoying each other you know and it i would have to Hashtag do it else. Fura. <laughs> <laughs> you right yeah, yeah. you know and it's just joy upon yeah. joy upon joy mm-hmm. and so that's what i decided to do i decided maybe i should give this whole relationship a thing a break mm. but on the occasion that you know you're having a lonely lonely thing you're just like you know we we'll have a small fling with somebody and then we have an understanding that you know it's just a, it, a probably i call it high intensive friendships yeah. Yeah. High intensive. <laughs> <laughs> intensive friendships yeah. but it's not like we are we're going to graduate <laughs> into you know those things yeah. no no yeah and, and it's interesting that like i just thought about something mm-hmm. the fact that you as a as a girl as a kenyan mm-hmm. uh, woman mm-hmm. being making that decision like um just culturally mm-hmm. culturally um i know myself yeah. i know i'm not ready for a relationship yes. anything i'm going to do now is going to be a fling because yes. i know there's an itch i'm scratching yes. and that's it yes. that decision is so controversial back home yes it and is and to say it out loud too it's like how dare you yeah. take charge of your, of your sexual life. journey yeah. and your and your <laughs> love life and you, you know it's like so it's interesting that it's evident that you had to because i value that because yes. i think it's something that a lot of girls might not mm-hmm. might not connect those dots where it's like it's okay to know that okay i'm not the married mm-hmm. i'm not the marriage type right now yes. and i'm not saying i'm not ever going to be yes. but where i'm at right now it's like 
I have certain things that I need to fulfill in the short run, right. but I, that doesn't mean I have to include the long run right now. Yes. But it's just knowing, could you do it? Just knowing exactly. yourself. It's exactly. like it's okay to yeah. know that you all you need is a fling right now. Yes. And, know? And, and, you know, it's, and it's even how frequent those flings happen for me because yeah. it's, it's one of those things where, so in the past, it, at the same time, it speaks to that whole idea of being a lone wolf, right? In the past, I have re- probably had one or two after the two-year situation, but then it died also because it's almost like now I don't. I if I want, I'll do it. Yeah. But then in the last it's two years, habit. yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not one of those things that, that I even want that often because when my schedule gets packed, also it's one of those things where like I can't have somebody blowing up my phone like that, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so it's okay to take charge, but I I made those decisions when I was here, because back home. Even when you're seen with a friend who is a boy, yep. So who are his parents? Mm-hmm. So are you getting married? Mm-hmm. You know, and it's one of those things. Either you're being condemned for it, or oh, that's very prostitute-like of you, mm-hmm. or it's just like, are you marrying him? You know, it, there's never that middle there's ground. There's no in between, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I was able to make those decisions for myself being here, and also, the more my parents and my family has traveled, we have been exposed to different ways of thinking. So having those conversations with my parents have become much easier. Mm, that's yeah. interesting. How yeah. far have you guys gone on that journey of discussing such things? So with my mom, I tell her everything. Okay. Yeah. With my dad, I can't say, I, I tell him everything that he needs to know. <laughs> yeah. That he needs that to know. That makes sense, yeah. In a, because at the same time, you know when uh, your parents are investing so much money in you, when it comes to academia, you don't want to show that you're too distracted, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it's but that's a bad thing. It is. Too, it, it's, like, yeah, it's part of life, it's part of right? Life. It's like, part of life. So yeah. I would want them to be aware that oh, you know, there's this, yeah. you know. But you have to give them. Yeah, yeah. I'm just giving yeah. them. And actually, yeah. sometimes I end up telling them after it's over. But it's over. Yeah. But it's over. Yeah. So don't worry about yeah. it. Yeah. And so like um, was so now life in Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, you're here now and. How long have you been here so far? Since five years. So five years. Yeah. And in that five years, what has been the biggest change for you? Because like you came in already having learned a certain set of Maria skills. Yes. What are the new Maria skills that you've learned now? So the new set of skills for me, key is communication. Mm. Communication and also not acting on assumption, right? You know those conversations that you have in your own head when you have not spoken to somebody yet and so your reaction tends to be based on, on what yeah on my assumptions mm-hmm. and i haven't called this person but then i'm thinking but even if i call them they'll they refuse would, to answer yeah, my phone yeah. they'll make me feel bad <laughs> you know yep. and so you know you start getting angry about things that don't feel, make sense sorry to interrupt but, but i feel very analyzed right now just yeah. so you know <laughs> that's why i'm sitting <laughs> back serious? i'm like okay chill out yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. it happens to the best of us yeah. and that's how some relationships but they have ended you know mm-hmm. and not because i made assumptions in my head and then I was like, you know, this girl, she's just trying to play with my head right now. You know, you even when I called her the other day, or maybe her reaction when I told her this, she wasn't as enthusiastic. And for me, enthusiasm is so important. So much so that if I tell you something and you're like, uh, ha, let me tell you, catch me telling you anything any other day, I will not invite you to anything. And I will almost try to purposely make you feel bad mm-hmm. by inviting everybody else oh, around wow. you and yeah. isolating you. So you will not be enthusiastic by choice. Mm-hmm. You actually have to do mm-hmm. it. So you see how far I've gone, mm-hmm. you know, and these are things that are happening in my own head. Yeah, yeah. These are things that are happening in my own I could have just spoken to you and so and so. Well, how is it? That, you know, and if you react badly, that's one thing. But for me to make up that whole story yeah. for myself, yeah. so I have learned how to will it in. I have learned how to will it yeah. in. Even sometimes it could be things. So, for example, in my family, in my between my siblings and I, again, because living with them also, there is no authority. So if if somebody does something, I'm like, "Mommy, uh, Michael did this." No, now it's up to me and Michael to hash it out. Or mm-hmm. me and Naomi, or my, me, me and David, right? So it's one of those things where I can't assume the worst because, and that's how I learned not to make assumptions mm. with my family, mm. because we live in a space together. If I start assuming the worst, we're going to have a very difficult it's relationship, end bad, right? Yeah. yeah, very very difficult. And at the same time financially it doesn't make sense for all of us to live separately, separately yeah. Yeah, yeah so i was like you know what we're going to have to hash things out mm-hmm. and that's what that's the key thing that i learned how to communicate and actually get to the bottom of things mm-hmm. right and if somebody is honestly honestly being distasteful also my reaction to that is important mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. i cannot 
I can no longer approach you with hostility. I will have to resolve that this is, this person could be going through something. And nine out of ten people are going through things, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so you know the people that I cut off later on, I heard from friends that they were going, they were through, going things. through something, like, and, it's, oh, and then you're like, damn, oh my gosh, now I look like me. such an yeah. asshole. Yeah, because now it's like now had I known, I would not have been you know as that crude. Sucks, yeah. yeah, but you know it is what it is, and so I have to. So I'm Catholic, so I have to go confess my sins. <laughs> And then I also, at the same time, if I can make, you know, I can make uh, amends amends with Mm -hmm. those people, then that's fine. But if I can't, then it is what it is. Mm -hmm. I have to learn from that situation and make sure the next person that I deal with, I'm not as hostile Mm -hmm. with them. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, Mm -hmm. Communication is huge for me, too. It's huge. I mean, especially, and I was talking to someone yesterday and I was telling them, especially with a podcast. Yes. Um. It's like I, before I started doing this podcast or any of my other podcast, I had to come in and kind of like see what I was trying to do. Yeah. And in terms of like trying, I had something I wanted to communicate. I mm-hmm. could feel it. Mm-hmm. But then when I listened back, I was like, damn, even when I'm in a room alone, mm-hmm. I can't communicate mm-hmm. what I'm really feeling. Mm-hmm. It's like, why didn't it come out? I'm yeah. all alone. It's <laughs> just me. It should be able to come out. And it, this was at a point, this was a few, like, less than a year ago where yeah. I was doing this at a point when I thought, I'm ready to communicate. So yeah. that's why I'm coming here to mm-hmm. record. So it's, like, super important. Yeah. Communi- I re- I've realized, for me, the reason why it used to come out is because I live with family. Mm. Again, right? When I surround myself, when you surround yourself with people who genuinely love you and care for you, you will get called out on things that you wish they did mm. not. Mm. You know, because what one thing I've realized for myself is that when I go through, <coughs> when I'm going through something, I don't like hearing opinions. I don't I, think anyone does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, and sometimes, so, and that's why sometimes when your friends ask you, so how are you doing? So how are you really doing? Mm. Do you genuinely think I'm going to tell you how I'm doing? I cannot because I'm in a tunnel and right now i can't see that light yeah right so yeah. if i tell you i'm you know i'm almost going to be adjusting the direction of my tunnel mm, based on what you're saying mm. you know but i you, and so with the thing with family they will call you out at every point Whether of that you tunnel, like it or not. and you're just <laughs> like can you shut up <laughs> and but then at the end of the day you know yeah. and you, you start expressing to them things because at the end of the day you tell yourself this is my family who are you going to tell no one but so. you, you, you know what's interesting uh. i feel like that's you being a strong person because i feel as though there's the potential for if, if being with family, like being with family a lot for some people might have the opposite effect uh-huh. where they don't know how to express themselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I feel like that's props to you for being able well, to do that. Because <laughs> I feel like when you're with family, at uh-huh. least how I see it, it's your comfort zone. It's where you don't get those questions. Yeah. And like maybe that's just a testament to how healthy your family is with communication. It's huge you know? for us. So like, because uh-huh. my, in my experience, I don't think if I stayed with my family, mm-hmm. I would be the total opposite. Right. I would not express anything. I Also because I was the youngest. Mm-hmm, so it's mm-hmm. like, it, it depends a lot. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So like in that case, I would go even deeper. Into deeper. yourself. Yeah. 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 Uh, it, so the reason why I, I, ever since I was a child, ever since I can remember, I can't hold down anything. Yeah. You know, it, because it'll have physical manifestations, mm, right? Mm. It'll have, you know, either I'll, you know, get headaches or just be agitated. Like, I can't keep anything in my heart, right? It, it's just one of those things where I will explode and you will all know that, mm-hmm. you know, you don't fuck up mm-hmm. and then I will move on, right? Yeah. And it helps me to move on. Yeah. My capacity to move on, sometimes irrespective of who I had, mm. is important. Mm. I have to move on. Yeah. So, and if you're getting in my way, I will just have to haul you out, right? But I have to move on. Mm-hmm. So if that means, but now how I do it is important. I, if I come to you and like, listen, next, you know, we've had this, da, 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 da. it's important that we talk. But if you're being aggressive, ah, <laughs> yeah. I'm still moving on, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so communication has been key. And also at the same time, clarity. Mm. Mm. When demanding clarity, actually, to be more specific, when people are not clear with their intentions to be in a friendship or a relationship with you, that's something that makes me anxious mm-hmm. and I will not stand it. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. It's one of those things where you need to be very specific exactly why. And it, it's very uncomfortable. Don't get me wrong. Especially with a friend. It's like, ah, see, we're just friends. <laughs> like, no. I mean, we are friends. Yeah. But at the same time, if you... You know, you have an agenda or you want to make someone feel bad using me mm-hmm. or, you know, you know, you're not sure, especially when it comes to a relationship with a, with a, an, a somebody of the opposite gender or same gender or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's almost like you 
want to you're not sure what you want mm. but you're just there with me and yeah. you're in this still situation yeah. nope 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 yeah nope. I do not have the time or the because the truth is with every person in my life even my barista mm. I invest a certain amount yeah. of affection for that person yeah. I walk into the coffee shop he already knows what I want mm. you know I invest a certain amount of you know affection for every single person I come across mm. in this world mm. so that uncertainty for me is not acceptable because when I invest in you and then you decide to toss me away right those are very hurtful things mm mm-hmm. And those are not things people can easily admit that they are hurt. Those are very hurtful it things. It is. It is. Yeah. Right? And so I cannot allow myself to be in a situation like that, right? So you're going to be have to be very forthcoming mm-hmm. at the very beginning like what do you want? Do you want us to be friends? Do you want us to be partners? What are you, you know, mm-hmm. tell me where your mind is at. Mm-hmm. But if you're like I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I th- you not knowing is fine, but it but just means I'm not going involved. to invest that much. Yeah. 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 I see I'm like, "Hi." Yeah, yeah. And that don't like know that. over and, and there. there yeah, yeah. I don't know that corner yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you can't not knowing over here. Yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. so yeah, and it's been hard to do that because you know, f- for the most part, I've taken in taken in people who have hurt me incredibly. Mm. But I wouldn't cha- change those experiences for anything in the world because mm-hmm. mm, it has toughened me. And at the same time. When like I told you you know with the bullying mm-hmm. when you start seeing it elsewhere like oh I've seen know that, that before yeah. yeah so that's that's pretty much yeah. how I've gotten through it Th- wow. thank you for sharing first of all yeah, okay. um like those are not easy things to like open up about mm-hmm. and so right now how are you right now yeah. I am still as still can be yeah yeah I yeah. mean it's a uh, um I will say that I am in a better position than I have been in in the last 5 years. There's a lot of clarity. The clouds, the dark clouds in my life have, mm-hmm. you know, faded away. And so we we are aware w- I know what I want. I know where I'm going and at the same time there's certain parts where I don't know mm-hmm. where I'm going, mm-hmm. but that's also fine. Yeah. Yeah. At least you know that you don't know. Uh, yeah. yeah. At least I know that I don't know, but I also at the same time most importantly, I know what I don't mm. want. That's very important. So recently my dad sent me an article about uh ambition and lack there of like like lacking ambition in general. And he compared people like in the Bible like Adonijah and people like David. Mm-hmm. Uh, Explain that Adon- I don't know who Adonijah. Adon- okay, let's say let's say Adonijah. So let's say for example someone like David, everybody knows David in the Bible, right? And then somebody like uh you know uh I don't know. Samuel mm-hmm. in the Bible. Mm-hmm. There those are people who didn't know what they wanted mm. out of life mm-hmm. but then god chose them and made kings out of them he chose them and made prophets out of them but there were people like adnija these are i believe those were solomon's brothers if mm-hmm. i'm not wrong okay. those were military men those mm. are people who knew what they wanted okay. those are people who are primed to be king but when king david died who did god make king Solomon mm. not his brothers mm-hmm. and they actually thought about it but you know Solomon still won mm, okay. yeah so it's okay not to know what you want but you know what you don't want mm. you don't want hostility you don't want negativity you don't want rap- yeah. yeah but and, and not knowing actually it broadens your horizon you know that right because now it's almost like your mind space has that freedom to choose anything anything yeah you know when you, sometimes Options. you know when you're ambitious you know there's a tunnel you have that tunnel yeah. vision you're pigeonholed into something you know mm. but now when you don't know you're like you know i could also do this yeah. but i could also do this but i could also do this yeah. you know yeah, yeah. yeah. and it so it opens frees yourself up exactly yeah. um yeah. <laughs> what about like for the future like are you a long term thinker now are you what are you what are your plans in terms of moving forward so for me the key thing is i i want to have influence. Now a lot of people I've met my peers are very uh uh they're very interested in making money mm-hmm. at this point, right? And I can understand that. You know, life is not easy A B C D B C D and making money is important. Even I work from time like I wa- I used to work last year mm-hmm. and then I also this way I work on occasion but mm-hmm. mostly doing school work. But I feel like if I place my focus on making money like my creativity flies out the window. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's something that scares me because I my confidence comes from my creativity, 
right? The fact that I can think about that. And even sometimes when I tell my friends, I'm they're like, mm. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I probably should copyright that now before you take it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you <know>? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so the key thing for me is irrespective of whatever lifestyle I lead, you know, I could be in a studio or in a very small living arrangement. So long as I have that space to be creative, mm. I want to carry my creativity into the future. Now, I'm very passionate about girls in STEM. So girls in oh, science, technology, okay. engineering, okay. and mathematics. Nice. And particularly girls in Africa. Mm. And in, you know, in Africa, where are you being told? There's that, the, the, the patriarchy has lied to our girls that they're not good on in anything science related. Mm. They should stick to the arts. The arts are beautiful, by the way. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. But at the same time, sciences are still something girls can do, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so when you come here, even when, when I go back home and then I tell my aunts, oh yeah, I took math. Math! Yeah. Even kindergarten math was hard for yeah. me. And I was just like, yeah. you know, the thing is, I feel like most of that was you being told it was hard yes. for you. Yes, it's all you attitude, know, it's man. all, the, And that's how I changed mine, mm-hmm. you know. I had to change my attitude from, you know, thinking I can't do it mm-hmm. to, you know what, and it's not that I didn't fail next. I failed. <laughs> I failed to the degree my parents thought, uh, you know, I was even placed on academic probation at some oh, point. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's how badly yeah. I failed, you know. But then you bounce back, you know. You keep bouncing back, you know. And so it's one of those things where you can't, you have to tell somebody, even boys fail in maths. Mm-hmm. You know that. Mm-hmm. They also fail. Yeah, even, so you just keep going. But yeah. then another thing for me, I've real, I, real, I never placed... Please barriers for myself in my head as much as i was aware of the f- barriers that exist in life for women black women for you know being abcd abcd those barriers never existed in my head mm-hmm. and I, if it i was aware like for example at ubc mm-hmm. when i enter a math class first you'll find that three four girls second you'll find i'm the only black person mm-hmm. in that class so already institutionally there are so many layers that you know they can they, they're pretty much against you right but for me it didn't look like that it was just like i'm a person who is in class trying to learn you know this subject that's it. right that's yeah. it mm-hmm. and if it's difficult it's not difficult because i'm black it's not difficult because i'm a girl it's difficult because it's bloody difficult right and i will get the help that i need mm-hmm. barriers have never existed in my head never to any capacity so much so that when i came to school and of course you're being taught about you know the layers that that make up who I am and so on and so forth and how they have acted as a barrier to other people. For example, there was a gentleman who told me at school that, mm. at UBC, that, you know, don't bother working too hard. You're a black woman. Uh. You will have, you know, things coming at you. And I, in a, and for me, and even at that age, I, I was 23, 24, I was like, now what does that mean? Because mm. it's just like, I have never felt like mm. my blackness is a barrier. The people around me Made are the barriers. Way, yeah. And they are the barriers. Mm-hmm. My blackness is not an obstacle. Yeah. And neither is my me being a woman the people around me are the obstacles and if i can eliminate you out of my way i will achieve whatever the hell i feel like right Mm -hmm. and so that it's been i'm glad i never had to feel inferior to anyone at any point mm-hmm. and sometimes even you end up feeling superior like ah now you're the ones who are supposed to threaten <laughs> me you know and I'm just like mm, please but then again that's uh, that, that's that conversation exactly, of balancing yeah exactly balancing yeah, it yeah. you know to some degree but mm-hmm. it's just like you need to try harder to yeah. threaten me <laughs> <laughs> yeah man oh man yeah. I think we've run out of time but okay. like thank you so much for you're sharing welcome. everything you've shared so far man I really enjoyed this uh, conversation me too that was yeah. great <laughs> man I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank man, so and much. thank you again. And for everyone who's been listening, um, thank you for joining us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, I guess stay strong. I don't know, man. Yeah. Just whatever you can take from this conversation we've had, stay I really true. hope. Yeah, stay, stay true, true, for sure. Strength is built, but stay true to who you are. I have nothing else to say. Yeah. <laughs> Peace. <laughs>
Video editing by Russ Rara and intro music by Mick Narciso.